Jesus. He was born and he became this like prophet for eventually what would become Christianity. And then at the age of 32, he died on the cross and it's like three days later he was resurrected. Jesus is the, our Lord and Savior that died on the cross for us for our sins. Jesus is a uh, person that existed that continues to enrich the lives of people every day. Jesus is God's son and he was sent to save our sins. I think he is a pretty cool guy. He had a, a peaceful philosophy. I think he's misinterpreted by a lot of people. He's the savior of this world. I don't know, because I don't really believe in him, so I don't really think anything of him. I, I mean, he could have been a real person. I mean, I'm sure he was. I mean, I'm sure he was just, you know, good at what he did or something. Jesus is God, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just learned that. Uh, Jesus was a man, from what I figure. He was just kind of a guy with a really unique, positive message as that kind of gave a lot of people a lot of hope. He died on the cross for us and uh, to save us and rose again from the dead. I don't want it to sound smart, but... <laughs>
Also, salvation comes to those who trust in Jesus as Lord. And we're going to understand that a little bit more as we get, dig into John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So if we, we were to con describe what is Christianity, these are three main bullets. Triune God, Jesus as the only Savior of the world, and that salvation comes to those by trusting and believing in Jesus as Lord. All right, question number two, what has this one God done? So what makes God special? Uh, look at these verses again, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And in Galatians chapter four, uh, four, four through five, he says, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. I love that word adoption. It reminds us that we were brought into a family. So what has this one God done? A few things we can highlight here. I mean, he's done immensely more than we could ever imagine or dream of. And scripture even just uh, scratches the surface of what God has done for us. But clearly, if we were to highlight some of the things, number one, God made all things and loves his creation. Genesis points to the fact that God is the creator of all things, including, including you and me. And not only did God create all things, but he loves us, he preserves us, he takes care of us. Uh, God has also sent his son. So even despite our, our sin and the fall of mankind into sin, he didn't abandon us. So he sends his son to rescue the world, to redeem and save humanity by his death and resurrection. God had a salvation plan for us from the beginning. God also sent his spirit, what we call the Holy Spirit, to call us back. So the Holy Spirit gathers and calls us to be a part of his family. He calls us back to be his own through faith in Jesus, the world's only hope, life, and salvation. We, we uh, connect this a little bit being called back into the family, kind of like that word adoption. We were adopted back into God's family. Being part of God's family, there's a great inheritance, his love, his forgiveness, and eternal life. All right, number three, what is, the, what is a Christian then? So we talked about what is Christianity, what has God done, what does it mean to be Christian? First Corinthians uh, responds to it by saying, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. First Corinthians 12 verse three says, therefore I, wanna, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, which reminds us that for us to profess God, uh, the true faith in Christ, that we trust and believe in him, only comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. So what is a Christian? Number one, a Christian is someone who by the power and work of the Holy Spirit through God's word believes in Jesus as Savior and Lord. So again, trusting in the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, called by the Holy Spirit through his word, we believe in Jesus as our savior. Number four, what does it mean to confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord? So now we talked about what is, what is uh, Christianity? It's confessing the triune God. What does it mean when we do that personally? Uh, Romans 10 uh, verse nine and 13, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says, Therefore, as you receive Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Um, so when we talk about this confessing Christ as Lord, it means that we trust in him in life, that we depend on him, we lean on him, and in death, even in, in, as we face death, we do not need to fear death because we trust in Jesus and his plan. We, we uh, trust in him as our savior, or my savior, and my God. His death and resurrection have saved me from all my sins and assured me of the resurrection to eternal life. I am his own and want to live for him forever. John, uh, Romans 3.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Um, but the good news is that Jesus paid the penalty for my sin. He paid the death that I deserved to save me. Um, so where do we learn about this? So we, in, in uh, the next several weeks here in cross training and actually throughout the three years, uh, we teach you on a variety of different topics. Where does that um, come from? Where is that source um, built on? And so uh, John 20 verse 31 says, but these are written so that you can believe that Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I wonder where it was written. 
2 uh, Timothy 3.15 says, From childhood you have been acquainted with these sacred writings, which are able to make you wise to salvation through, uh, Christ, uh, through faith in Christ Jesus. These sacred writings, are, is, as it was written, is speaking specifically about God's word, the Bible. So everything that we teach here in Confirmation ought to and will be and should be and um, needs to be founded on the word of Christ, the word of God through the Bible. So God's truth about Jesus Christ is made known in the Bible. Uh, that's why you have your Bible at home uh, and in class that we use that throughout class. That's where we have the foundation, the basis of what we teach. You notice that we put Bible verses at the bottom here for you to understand where we get the, the context to answer the questions that we have. All right, number six, what is the Bible then? Uh, Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 2 says, Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed as heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So here we see both through God, uh, through the word of Christ, but also through the prophets in the Old Testament, in the old times. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God, which... Um, we say inspired. God gave the words and the thoughts to the people that wrote down these words in the various books of the Bible. Um, so he breathed out by God and pro, uh, it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So what is the Bible? Um, first of all, it's a collection of writings of God's chosen people. So over a period of more than a thousand years that the Bible was written, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, the Bible is actually a collection of books. Um, both Old Testament and New Testament are a collection of different books written by different people over a span of a uh, significant amount of time. Um, God gave these writers the thoughts and words that they recorded, such as the Bible is God, and, and therefore the Bible is God's word. So just like here in Second uh, Timothy 3, 16 says, all scripture is breathed out by God, meaning that God inspired, he gave the words to the writers um, that wrote it down. And because it is inspired, because God breathed it into the, um, into the authors of the various books, we can depend and trust that these are truly God's word for us. Um, scriptures are both infallible and inerrant. It means that they are without error and that they are without, uh, and that they are trustworthy. We can depend on trust on them and they are um, without error. Um, Holy Scripture is entirely reliable and gives us everything we need to know and believe for Christian faith and life. So not only God's word gives us source, source and strength for every day, it gives us words of comfort, encouragement, it gives us words of, of a correction and uh, to point towards his truth uh, based on the law. Um, but it also gives us God's rescue plan for us. That's the ultimate message that it wants to tell us, that not only God created us, but he has a rescue plan to rescue us from our fallenness, our sin and brokenness. Number seven, what are two great doctrines of the Bible? So as we, we dig through scripture, especially here as we get, get into the Ten Commandments, which is specifically around God's law, we're going to explore two different messages, two main themes that we see throughout the Bible. Um, one thing we know that all of God's word, uh, both the law and the gospel, these two main messages, uh, which I'm just, I just almost messed it up, but the law and the gospel are the two main messages. Both these messages come out of love for us. Um, sometimes we think of the law as being um, given as punishment or a, a negative idea behind the law. So even in our homes and our families and our world, we have rules and sometimes we think negatively of it. But if we're really honest and we think about the law in our world, um, it's a good thing it's there, both in our, in our uh, countries and our communities we live in, as well in our home, that uh, our parents give us rules to keep us safe. Uh, they give us rules to make sure that we grow up um, and become all that God has created us to be. Um, we have rules in our communities to keep us safe, uh, to protect people. So God gives us a lot out of love as well. He cares for us, and because of that, he gives us rules and boundaries. Uh, we'll explore some of the different purposes behind the law, but the gospel, on the other hand, so the law is God's rules, his law. The gospel is um, his good news, uh, his rescue plan for us. So let's dig into this a little bit more. What is the law? God loves us through the law by, number one, teaching us what we are to do and not to do. So 
Uh, here, especially as we get into the Ten Commandments, we're going to see very clearly, both on each commandment, what we should do and what we should not do. Um, and uh, the second part is uh, showing us our sin and the need for a Savior. So one of the purposes of God's law is kind of like a mirror. You know, you look in a mirror and you see a reflection. God's law gives us a reflection into our reality. It reminds us, you know what, we've got a problem. We have sin in our life that leads to death, sin that leads to separation. And knowing that helps us realize that we need a plan. We need something to rescue us from that. Um, so here we see a diagram. Um, maybe you've seen this before. Uh, we use this in our communion instruction class. And um, maybe one way to think about sin and the gospel here in a little bit is um, the Bible is very clear that our sin, even at the beginning of time with Adam and Eve, man fell into sin. And because of that, it created separation from God. Sin separates us from God. So um, it's since the time of the fall, uh, we have had a broken relationship with God. Now, the problem with this is that outside of, outside of a relationship with God, um, it only leads to death. And um, so sin is a, is a, um, is a um, very serious thing for us. So the law reminds us of that. It says we've got a big problem and uh, we need a solution. Uh, the gospel, on the other hand, um, God loves us through the gospel. So the gospel is the other second main message of the Bible. First of all, that teaching us what God has done and still does in Jesus for our salvation. And then also it shows us our savior in bringing God's grace and favor. So where the law shows us that we're sinful, the gospel is a message that Jesus rescues us from our sin. So if we go back to the, to the uh, illustration here again, sin separates us from God, but through Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good message, the good news of God's salvation to us, rescuing us from our sins, the cross in a sense has restored, has created a bridge, if you will. Let's see if I can do this here really quick. So the gospel has, um, through Jesus Christ, created a bridge a cross, And so through his death, his resurrection, his death paying the penalty for our sins has restored a relationship back with God. Um, and that's the good news of the gospel. We'll explore this whole concept a lot more later. So finally, um, number 10 in your handout asks this question, what is confirmation? So we are here at Family of Christ, we call our confirmation instruction cross training, but it all leads up to a special day. Um, it's normally taken place during ninth grade year, um, and we have an opportunity for students to uh, partake in a really special worship service, and that's what we call the right, uh, the right of confirmation. So what is confirmation specifically, the right of it? It's a public right of the church preceded by instruction in which Christians learn about confession, life, and mission of the Christian church. So the instruction period is what you guys are in right now. So through cross training, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, as we learn the various um, uh, components of the Christian faith, it's working towards this public right of, of confirmation. And you can see over here, uh, one of our pictures of a class. So we do this every year and students wear a white robe, which remain, reminds us that we are made clean. We are forgiven in Christ. The white um, is a symbol of purity. Um, the stole is a reminder that uh, we are called to be disciples, so kind of like a shepherd's stole that they will lead and guide. And as we live out our calling uh, as Christians, we share the good news, the, the message of the gospel with people around us. And so it's a reminder that we are called to go out and serve and make a difference. So anyway, we dress up, we put on the gowns and the stoles. It's kind of a traditional thing that we do in the church here and um, you'll participate in a worship service, but during that service, you're gonna have an opportunity to profess or confess your faith publicly. Uh, your family members will come and it's gonna be a special day and you'll have an opportunity to, to confess that. We'll also remind you of the amazing promises that God made to you at your baptism, that he has adopted you into his family and that he will love you forever. And he's got a plan and purpose for you. So. That happens at your right of confirmation. It's an awesome day. It's kind of a cool way to wrap up our confirmation instruction. And then you move on to living out your faith by making a difference in this world. Uh, and I'm excited to see what God has in store for you.
So um, I want to talk a little bit about that confirmation instruction. So now, uh, as you are in seventh and eighth grade cross, uh, cross training, um, we start digging into other topics. So last year, if you were in sixth grade cross training, you know we went through Old Testament, New Testament history, where we want you to have a good understanding of the Bible and God's Word and how it relates to you. Um, but the next uh, two years here, uh, we're going to hit these different topics. So the Ten Commandments is part of our instruction series. That's this unit, unit one. Uh, next unit um, is the Creed, and that will, um, we're going to explore the three different persons of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, what they've done, what they continue to do in our life. Uh, the third part of our series is the Lord's Prayer, so we'll dig into a, a unit on prayer and how do we communicate and talk with God, and how do we listen to Him. And then the next uh, two sessions, are, or three sessions, are on um, uh, the means of grace, which include the Holy Baptism, Office of the Keys, and Confession, and then um, the last one is Sacrament of the Altar, um, which is another fancy name for communion, uh, for communion, the Holy Communion. And uh, so through the Means of Grace series, we'll hit all three of those uh, in Unit 4. So that's where we're going in the next couple of years. Uh, we're excited to have you here for our Ten Commandment unit. And uh, we pray that through the Ten Commandments, not only will you understand what we should and shouldn't do, but we'll understand how God loves us and how he has a plan and purpose for us. And that uh, he didn't leave us in our sin. He gave us a plan out of it. But also through the Ten Commandments, we learn how to love and care for others in the world we live. All right, so there we go. That's our uh, uh, topic for today, our heart knowledge. So every week we'll have a different Bible verse to memorize. This week is John 3:16. It's a great one to start off. Many of you already know this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. If there's any verse you will never want to forget, it's this one. It's probably one of the most powerful verses in the Bible to remind us what God has done for us. Uh, so memorize this at home. Um, when you're done, you can have your parents sign off on that back side of your handout, and uh, there's a section for it. Uh, and then on the back side of your sheet, make sure you get together with uh, some family members, your mom and dad, or uh, whoever you can get together as a, as a group at home. Go through the discussion questions on the back side of your handout today, and um, there's a number of ways to kind of dig and process through today's lesson. Uh, you'll notice some quotes in there today. I, I thought some of these are pretty neat. What, uh, maybe think about which one kind of stands out to you the most. Warren Wiersbe says this, when a person does not know the doctrines of the Christian faith, he can easily be captured by false religions. And I love that because it reminds us why we teach you this stuff. It's really important that you have a solid understanding of the Christian faith. Without it, um, it can, it's easy to be deceived into false, um, false theology, false belief. So knowing it well, makes you strong and resilient. Um, C.S. Lewis said this, I believe Christianity is I believe that the sun is risen, uh, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything. And so reminding us that our Christian faith is not just a part of our life, but it is who we are. It identifies who we are in Christ. It, it identifies how we live out in this world. So it's not just a part, it's all of who we are. This last one I love is from Bear Grylls from Man vs. Wild. Maybe you've heard of him before. He's a Christian um, adventurist, I guess. He says this, and Jesus, the heart of the Christian faith, is the wildest, most radical guy you'll ever come across. And isn't that true? Jesus, who came and uh, gave his life for us, sacrificed in a way almost unimaginable to us, out of no reason, no obligation to do it, um, out of his mercy, he loves us despite of our brokenness. That's pretty wild. And we're going to learn about this radical Christ, this radical God who loves us in ways that doesn't make sense in our world. So anyway, join us in that journey. We're looking forward to it. And uh, uh, so with that, it concludes. Again, um, complete your lesson. Do the backside discussion. Get together with the family members. Uh, and then um, make sure that you, uh, when you get done, you can complete the lesson by having a parent sign off at the bottom. You can either bring it to class next time, or if you need to take a picture of it, send it to me that you completed the work and got the signatures. We'll give you credit for the lesson today. So again, thanks for joining us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week as we dig into um, the Ten Commandments. So God bless you. Have a great week. Bye now.
I will live my life according to these beliefs. God does not exist. It's just foolish to think that there is an all-knowing God with a cosmic plan. That an all-powerful God brings purpose to the pain and suffering in the world is a comforting thought. However, it is only wishful thinking. People can do as they please without eternal consequences. The idea that I am deserving of hell because of sin is a lie meant to make me a slave to those in power. The more you have, the happier you will be. Our existence has no grand meaning or purpose. In a world with no God, there is freedom to be who I want to be. But with God, life is an endless cycle of guilt and shame. Without God, everything is fine. It is ridiculous to think I am lost and in need of saving. And that's how I felt before Christ opened my eyes, changed my heart, and reversed my thinking. I am lost and in need of saving. It is ridiculous to think everything is fine without God. Life is an endless cycle of guilt and shame, but with God, there is freedom to be who I want to be. In a world with no God, our existence has no grand meaning or purpose. The more you have, the happier you will be is a lie meant to make me a slave to those in power. Because of sin, I am deserving of hell. The idea that people can do as they please without eternal consequences is only wishful thinking. It is a comforting thought, however, that an all-powerful God brings purpose to the pain and suffering in the world, that there is an all-knowing God with a cosmic plan. It's foolish to think God does not exist. I will live my life according to these beliefs.